The year is 1932. Rally racer Lucy O'Reilly Shell, her husband and co-pilot Laurie, fellow rallyer Hector Petit, and Jacques Marciac, a reporter for the Parisian Le Journal, have just left Sunsval in their black Bugatti T44, making their way to the Monte Carlo Rally starting line in Umea, Sweden. Laurie quickly pilots the car through the thick Arctic fog, cautiously aware of the four-inch thick black ice below them. Suddenly, the tire chains fail to catch the Bugatti as it veers and then glides into the air, about to take flight. Before anyone in the car can even scream, the Bugatti smacks forcefully into a snowbank. Laurie and Lucy make sure their passengers are uninjured and then address the real issue. The team needs to make it to Omea before the rally is set to begin or they won't be permitted to compete. To Lucy Shell, the 5'4", norm-defying rally driver, this is not a fate she would allow her carmates to entertain for long. Lucy sends Hector and Jacques off to look for a nearby farmhouse for help. Then she and Laurie begin to desperately hack at the snow with their picks and shovels. It is 1 o'clock in the morning, 30 below zero, and they're stuck in the middle of a pine forest at least 10 miles from the nearest village. Though the two realize their seemingly insurmountable odds, the shells need to free their Bugatti and continue the rally as planned. This show of tenacity would turn out to be routine for Lucy O'Reilly Shell, the sports car driving heiress that would later put together a team of unlikely heroes to beat Hitler at one of his favorite games, motorsport. Today on Pass Gas, it's the fascinating story of a team of underdogs that came together to beat the most powerful engines the Nazis could design. Who is the designer behind the Delahaye 145, the odd little race car that ended a four-year German winning streak? Why did Lucy Schell transition from a rally racer into the first female owner of a Grand Prix team? And who is Rene Dreyfus, the Jewish race car driver who absolutely humiliated Hitler with his unexpected win? All that and more today on Past Gas. Past Gas Podcast. It's about cars, it's not about forts. Della hey, della ho, della hi, della he he, a live your life. Hey, Lucy, <laughs> you're gonna go and be Hitler, a live your life. <laughs> Lucy, very cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no one's made a Lucy, Lucy in the sky with shells song yet, huh? Lucy no. in the sky with shells. Lucy in the sky with shells. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that the Beatles don't slap. <laughs> Haven't had Didn't that it? take on the show in a good while. Thank you, James, for bringing that back up. Just so everyone knows, the Beatles don't even slap. So that movie yesterday doesn't make any sense. <laughs> 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 Welcome back to Past Gas, everyone. Uh, I'm your host, Nolan Sykes, joined as always by... Golden Lungs himself, Mr. James Pumphrey. And nice to be here. Excited to tell the tale. <laughs> and uh, chuckling Joe Weber. Uh, what's up, Wing Wing Nation? Hope you're keeping it juiced. <laughs> Keep it juiced. And today we are talking about Lucy Shell, a story that I am uh, admittedly not very privy to, but we've had a few requests for this, and it's been on our uh, it's been on our to do list. For for a short while now, so I'm excited to tell this story. I'm 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 stoked to have you guys with yeah. us here today. Thank you guys so much for checking out our show. We never get we never thank yeah. you guys up top. It's always at the end when people maybe maybe dip out. But uh, I just want to yeah. thank you guys for sticking with the show. And if you guys do dip out, if you do dip out at the end, I get it, I understand. But just so you know, we do thank you at the end every we single do. we do time. Thank you for your listens and thank you for your likes and thank you for your shares. Yeah. So I'm fine with you guys not listening to the very end. Well, I do feel bad for the people who don't listen to the end because they don't get to hear the secret. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. The well, secret. if you yeah. listen to the end, you do get to hear the secret. Yeah. yeah. The weekly secret. <laughs> the weekly secret. <laughs> All right. I'm excited for your guys' uh, weekly secrets. Yeah, and I'm excited for the fans to hear this week's weekly secret yeah, at sure. the very end of this very, podcast. The last part possible. Yeah. All right. After the Manscaped ad. It's like the 
the garage door is closing and we <laughs> roll right under it with a s- weekly secret. That's how my dad knocked out his four front teeth <laughs> trying to dive under a garage door what? that was closing. Yeah, when he was a kid. Oh my God, that's awesome. I bet his parents were. Is it? Very, I mean, no, but like. <laughs> that's I'll, awesome. That, that is, is awesome. awesome. That's a great kid that story. Is, that is a great awesome. kid story. <laughs> Good call. Scott, put your dad on the Zoom. I Put remember your dad in here. Um, <laughs> I want to see his gap. This is another dad story. It wasn't my dad, but my like one of my friend's dads. Uh, his finger got chopped, <laughs> chopped off because he was like trying to take something out of like a lawnmower while it was running. Oh, oh my god! My uncle off. did that too. <laughs> oh god! Your turn uncle? It off. Same turn thing. The, yeah. Turn turn the lawnmower off. Oh that's my god! All I gotta say. Yeah, that seems yeah. like like I heard that as a kid, and I was like. How, you turn it off. Like, what's the issue yeah. here? <laughs> yeah, it literally it's, takes it's, one it's, second yeah, to start. It is not hard to start it back up. <laughs> the risk. I versus, don't got time for that. Yeah, I like the how risk versus reward. Two of the three hosts in this show have heard of someone getting their finger chopped off in a lawnmower. <laughs> uh, there's an epidemic of people chopping their yeah. fingers off. Do not chop your finger Two off. Out of three. The, turn off that lawnmower. Wow, yeah. I've lived such a sheltered life. This is this is unreal. Um, I can't. It's like James, you wimp, man. You're not like in a battle rap against me. You guys could be like, <laughs> you say you're from the streets, but you don't even know anybody who cut their finger off with a lawnmower. And, and you come from a state that is known for grass, right? Kentucky bluegrass. bluegrass. Yeah, and then and then everyone's just like, oh, yeah. You say you from Kentucky, you not repping. You don't even know anybody. Who got their finger cut off with the lawnmower? Oh! And then the guy runs past oh. the camera like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, and I know, like, I'm not coming back from that. It's true. I don't. It's true. You're you're the last guy that uh, B Rabbit battled. Yeah, uh, the Falcon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it's been a great Lucy Shell. Lucy Shell. This has been the the, the film theorist podcast. Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, what? <laughs> Wait, I got Just a good a transition. Theory. I get a good segue. Hey, you know who else was in that movie? Uh, that rapper Shells. Yeah, which reminds speaking me of, of the, Shells. Speaking of Shells, Lucy Shell. Let's talk about it. All right. Oh, whoa, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy Shell was born Lucy O'Reilly on October 26th, 1896. Lucy's father, Francis Patrick O'Reilly, was the son of Irish immigrants who fled the Great Famine. Francis built a fortune in construction and through real estate investments, and like many of his contemporaries, set out to see the world. Uh, he finally settled down at the ripe old age of 46 with Henrietta Celestine Roudet, a French woman, and nine months later, in a Parisian hospital, Lucy was born. <laughs> As the only child of wealthy parents, Lucy was afforded every opportunity, which instilled in her a confidence unmatched by many of her peers. A biographer later wrote of her personality, quote, While she grew up in the United States and absorbed its spirit of independence, she remained unmistakably Irish in both looks and temperament, combining a natural charm and vivacity with headstrong courage, obstinate determination, and a careless outspokenness. In short, what Lucy wanted, Lucy got. However, Lucy was far from a spoiled heiress content to Scrooge McDuck into her piles of money. Instead, she used her advantages to live a life unexpected of an upper-class woman. At the time, wealthy women were not expected to work for money, and any labor they did perform was typically as, quote, ladies of charity or... I'm in the French. Dames de charité. Dames de charité. Thank you, guys. While Lucy did marry and have children, there are many in her circle who assumed both rites of passage would help tame her spirit, when in fact, they seemed to do just the opposite. Lucy met her husband, Salim Loris Laurie Shell, shortly before World War I, while traveling Europe on the rich person equivalent of Rumspringa. A gap year. I'm taking a gap year. Got to take that gap year. I did I'm going to go do mushrooms in Ibiza. <laughs> I got to find myself, daddy. <laughs> Laurie's parents were American, though as a son of a diplomat, he was French in spirit. Where Lucy was bold and loquacious, Laurie was reserved and quiet. Lucy's father warned her not to get serious with him as, quote, his life seemed to consist entirely of the pursuit of pleasure. 
Laurie didn't have much of an inheritance. But as usual, Lucy ignored the hell out of tradition, and the two never parted. That's sweet. Good on you, Lucy. Hey, he doesn't have a lot of money, but he's cool, you know? Yeah, kind of like us. Lucy's grand cultural tour of Europe was cut short by the Great War, and the heiress decided to volunteer volunteer, volunteer as a nurse. <laughs> she decided to volunteer as a nurse in France. The horrors she experienced chilled her to her bone, and her volunteer work is perhaps why she was so determined to take on the German propaganda machine years later. Eventually, after bouncing between the U.S. and France during the war, Lucy, Lori, and their two young children settled in Paris during a time Ernest Hemingway famously described as a movable feast. Lucy quickly became one of the wealthy American expats fueling the party, and her notoriety only grew when she discovered her love for racing. Due to Lucy's wealth, she could afford the best cars and enter the best races, so long as women were permitted to compete. So, cool chick, man. She sounds pretty bad. Yeah. I would love to, like, hang out with her and her flapper crew. <laughs> yeah, we'd be flapping and just... <laughs> Doing ro- the foxtrot and, and just drinking. roaring. Yeah. Lucy's first race was the 1927 Grand Prix de la Baule at the inaugural Journée Féminine de l'Automobile. <laughs> <laughs> so, wait, how that translates to the women's... Car journey? Yeah, it's like the rally for women with cars. She placed 12th in a Bugatti T37A and was officially hooked on the sport. By the early 1930s, Lucy was one of the top female drivers in Europe and often referred to as Speed Queen. Nice. I love those uh, washers and dryers. The Some of the best. You go into a laundromat, you see a Speed Queen, you're like... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll put 17 quarters into this thing. <laughs> yeah, all day. <laughs> <laughs> During the 30s, these female drivers were typically photographed by the press dressed to the nines in high heels, mink scarves, and pearls. It was only after the photos were taken that the drivers would change into their race overalls. Lucy loved this show and was perfectly content with driving fast and looking runway ready in the same afternoon. However, she was often frustrated by the misogynistic barriers she consistently drove up against. Motorsport was riddled with sexism. Camille Dugost, a female pioneer of the sport, was banned from certain events for feminine excitability. (laughs) Organizers often dictated what female drivers should wear, cartoonishly worried that their skirts would fly up (laughs) over their heads. Publications (laughs) like La Vie Automobile proclaimed that women were weak and delicate by definition and therefore not up to the muscular efforts needed to start a car, brake, or steer. Female drivers were a rarity in Grand Prix events, particularly because factory teams refused to let them join their ranks. So, yeah, there's that fun context to keep in mind um, as we tell Lucy's story. It's just like, uh, I, I think I think the racing world is like coming around to the idea of like, oh, yeah, like women racers can just be as, just as good, you know? Yeah. Uh, because that's true, you know? Um, faster reaction times. Very fast yeah. reaction times. I think I've told the story before on the podcast, but when I was doing junior drag racing as a child, all of the racers that you'd be scared to go up against were all girls because they had better reaction times. They were just they were just better. Uh, so I think I think my dad was a little disappointed because like when they when he tried to get one of my sisters to race, she she didn't she was not into it. She did not want to do it. Uh, oh. and he was like, man, could have had a real could have had a real shot. Instead, I've got this freaking dolt, this big lug head over here. <laughs> in the husky he, jeans. In the husky smart, jeans. In the Route 66 husky <laughs> jeans. <laughs> anyway, Lucy soon set her sights on rally racing. Her favorite event was the Monte Carlo Rally, a supreme test of endurance that ran from the competitor's choice between 19 far-flung places, including Stavanger, Norway, Gibraltar off southern Spain, Athens, or where the shells decided to select in 1932 Hmm. Umea Sweden. Umea is 100 miles from the Arctic Circle and 2,300 miles to Monte Carlo, where the rally concluded. The journey would take four days and three nights of nonstop driving with no allowances made for sleep, food, refueling, repairs, poor navigation, or accidents. In fact, when the journalist Marcelac asked Lucy when they would sleep, Lucy replied curtly, when everyone is too tired to drive. 
Monte Carlo is still a very uh, prestigious rally event. I believe it's the first, don't quote me on this, but I think it's the first rally event of the season in WRC. And nowadays it's done on like uh, mountain roads, paved mountain roads, but it's super snowy and very icy. And it takes real skill to even get down and up the mountain. Uh, but to yeah. win is like worthy of a lot of respect for sure. And this is like almost a hundred years ago. Yeah. yeah. And they're like, <laughs> yeah, a hundred years of technical innovation and reliability is like gone. Uh-huh. Yep. You're with your crew and you didn't allow any time f- to pee and <laughs> eat. Like that's crazy. And you're not wearing a helmet and you got a journalist in the car with you and another guy. <laughs> and my husband's coming. <laughs> now nowadays we get, don't have journalists. We just got little GoPros. We yeah. stick them in there. Yeah, <laughs> the journalist is a GoPro. <laughs> Now, this brings us back to our opening when we first met Lucy and Lowry as they furiously tried to dig their Bugatti out of a snowbank. After the accident, Marcelac and Hector Petit set off to find a nearby farmhouse for help, but gave up when they heard howls of wolves in the forest. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think we should go any further. (laughs) Meanwhile, the shells desperately hacked at the snow with their picks and shovels, but it was hopeless. The car wouldn't budge. A normal couple might suggest abandoning the race, but not the shells. It was Lucy's dream to become the first woman to win the Monte Carlo rally, and a little thing like a car accident would not stand in her way. Miraculously, the team was eventually saved by a truck with a snowplow and, I kid you not, 10 bearded Swedes. Lucy and Laurie placed seventh in the rally, and Jacques Marcelac later chronicled their exciting adventures in a five-part series for Le Journaux. In it, he expressed his admiration for the tireless Lucy shell and was particularly struck by how Lucy seemed to grow more fond of the race the tougher the conditions became. Through the early 30s, Lucy continued to perform well as a driver and often switched up her car of choice. She racked up wins across Europe in the Bugatti T35, Talbot M67, and Alfa Romeo 6C. Eventually, in 1933, she set her eyes on... This Type 35 won a ton of races, I think. It was made for the Targa Florio in Sicily. Mm-hmm. That's and the that's the wooden track. No, no, it's the rally race up up the like dirt mountain. Got it. Uh, but this Bugatti Type Thirty Five like dominated for a while. Yeah, the Type Thirty Five. That's like it was like famously like riveted together, right, Joe? And it was like made of magnesium, had a magnesium body. No, you're thinking of the mag, the one with the spine down the middle, and that's like that's like yeah. a road car, and it's. It was like forty-five million dollars or something. Yeah. No, and this one's like a little roadster. Okay, yeah. like a little. Oh, wheel. oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know what you're talking about. Okay. Anyway, if you've never heard of Delahay outside of the story, you wouldn't be alone. The French car company was founded in 1894, but was out of business by 1954. In 1933, Delahaye was already experiencing whispers of financial strain, so much so that the owners of the company needed to make big changes and fast. Ever since the crafting of their first car, Delahaye was known for building vehicles of consistent quality. Solid as a Delahaye was the company's motto. And the head of the company, Charles Weifenbach, was content to continue churning out dependable and durable vehicles. French car historian Francois Jolly once said that Delahaye built, quote, the perfect car to drive in a funeral procession. So you can imagine how the company was faring during the worldwide economic slowdown that occurred during the First World War. The owners of the company eventually landed on a somewhat genius fix for their financial woes. Instead of focusing on quantity of reliable cars and trucks, they decided to build fewer, better cars and to begin racing again. Charles was charged with making Delahaye a marquee name once more. To make a long story very, very short, he succeeded. Delahaye made two models, the Type 134 and the Type 138, which reached 100 miles per hour during its test drive. There were faster cars at the time, but for Delahaye, this was a great step forward. Enter Lucy and Lori Shell. Ever the firecracker, Lucy marched into Charles's office and demanded he build her a rally car. 
According to Lucy, she required a 134 for its shorter, lighter chassis, but with the straight six engine of the 138 to improve its potential. Basically, this is how muscle cars first started, uh, except much, much earlier. Charles was tickled by Lucy's tenacity. After she agreed to pay whatever was needed, the two shook hands, and it was the beginning of a beautiful partnership. Um, that was a cool, cool time. I was just going to say, this is like the classic formula of big engine, small car, go fast, you know? Mm -hmm. Lucy Shaw's first race in Adelaide was during the 1934 Paris-Nice rally. She finished eighth in the overall rankings, first in her engine class, and first again among the five female drivers, earning her the Coupe des Dames, which the, the ladies' trophy, I'm assuming. Dame Cup. The Dame's <laughs> Cup. Sweet. That evening at the event's dinner, she and her fellow driver, Rene Dreyfus, got to remember that name, were photographed standing together with their respective trophies. Though it is impossible to know for sure, Rene Dreyfus must have made an impression on Lucy Shell, but we'll get to that later. It's called foreshadowing. Yeah. <laughs> Your laugh was very cute. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. As, you know, to quote my favorite band ever, cute is what we aim for. Was that Deftones? No, that's a band called Cute is What We Aim For. Oh. And they were... <laughs> <laughs> so it's... Okay. They were like one of those skinny jeans and flat ironed hair bands. Mm. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Then we got that over with. Uh, back right, on, on the story of Lucy. In, <laughs> in 1936, Lucy suffered a string of losses and a moment of reckoning. And nearly 40 years old, Lucy realized it was unlikely she would ever achieve her dream of becoming the first woman to win the Monte Carlo rally. Never one to quit, though, Lucy determined it was time to find a new dream, to become the first woman to successfully run her own Grand Prix team. But before we can dive into that, we need to address the elephant in the room, the Nazis. A big thank you to our sponsor this week, Upstart. Are you carrying a credit card balance month to month? You're not the only one. I'm right there with you, pal. High interest rates can make it hard to pay off your debt, but Upstart can help. Join the thousands of happy borrowers who made that final payment thanks to Upstart. Upstart is the fast and easy way to pay off your debt with a personal loan all online. Who wants to leave the house? Honestly, I hate leaving the house. Whether it's paying off credit cards, consolidating high interest debt, or funding personal expenses, over half a million people have used Upstart to get a simple fixed monthly payment. Unlike other lenders, Upstart looks at more than just your credit score, like your income and employment history. This means they can offer smarter rates with trusted partners. So that's basically enough for me to be a fan. With a five minute online rate check, you can see your rate upfront for loans between $1,000 to $50,000. How easy is that? You can receive funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash gas. That's upstart.com slash gas. G-A-S. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Go to upstart.com slash gas today. Thank you, Upstart, for sponsoring this episode. Big thanks to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. What interferes with your happiness? Is something preventing you from achieving your goals? For me, it's like a little voice in my head telling me that what I'm doing is stupid. You have to silence those. And what better way to do it than with BetterHelp? BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. Everyone needs a little help once in a while. It's not a sign of weakness to reach out to a therapist. Mental health is extremely important, especially now. They'll connect you in a safe and private online environment, which is super convenient because you don't have to go to an office, you don't have to sit in a waiting room with other people, and you can start communicating within 48 hours. That means you reach out to BetterHelp, they pair you with a therapist, and you're talking with them within 48 hours. That's pretty cool. It's not a crisis line, it's not self-help, it's professional counseling done securely online. No worries about safety or anything. You can send a message to your counselor at any time, and you'll get a thoughtful and timely response. Plus, you can schedule a weekly video or phone session. I mean, all without having to wait in an uncomfortable waiting room. That's pretty cool to me. And if you don't like your counselor for any reason, 
BetterHelp will pair you up with a different counselor until you find the right one. And this service is available worldwide, so there's no excuse. BetterHelp has licensed professional counselors that can help you with anything from depression to stress to anxiety, grief, self-esteem issues, anger, family conflicts, you name it, they'll help you with it. And of course, everything you share is confidential. It's convenient, it's professional, it's affordable, so there's no reason you shouldn't check out BetterHelp. So I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash passgas. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash passgas. Thank you, BetterHelp. If you're paying attention to the timeline, you probably realize that we're inching closer to World War II. And if you're a fan of past gas, you know we did an episode on Hitler's racing program. But if you haven't listened to that episode yet, here's a little refresher. On February 11th, 1933, the new German Chancellor Adolf Hitler opened the Berlin Motor Show, declaring his intention to cut taxes and regulations on the struggling German motor industry and to boost funding to motorsport to dominate internationally. German automakers believed that Hitler's support, a.k.a. government money, was the best way out of the crisis. Hitler promised to fund race cars and even went so far as to promise Mercedes-Benz driver Manfred von Brockenst that he will receive the money the moment that Hitler rose to power. From 1934 to 1938, Hitler's silver arrows, the futuristic-looking aluminum cars piloted by infamous drivers like Rudy Caracciola and Bernd Rosemeyer, dominated. The only races Mercedes and Auto Union didn't win were the ones that they weren't permitted to race in. It's also relevant to note that there was a palpable shift amongst Grand Prix drivers themselves. Instead of the frenemy kind of camaraderie the drivers enjoyed prior to German domination, motorsport transformed into a jingoistic display of might, thanks largely to Hitler and Benito Mussolini's interest in the sport. German drivers were told to stay to themselves, and their cars were often cordoned off by rope to avoid prying eyes. That's kind of something I don't... That that's uh, not super present in motorsport nowadays. Like I don't really, even if Haas was truly based in the U S and had exclusively American drivers and sponsors, that wouldn't make mm-hmm. me like root for them exclusively. You know, like yeah. uh, I still root for you know Max Verstappen is like one of my favorite drivers and he's Dutch. You know, I love to see like Sergio Perez do great. You know, yeah, I guess Ferrari is like the only team or manufacturer that is like fiercely prideful of their Italian heritage and tries to hire Italians mostly. Right. That's fair. Yeah. To a, to a degree, to a degree. Uh, I think Mattia Bonato is actually from Switzerland. Their team. Principal. Really? Uh huh. Whoa. And Gunter Steiner is actually Italian. What? Yeah. Isn't that wild? That's super weird. Lucy was aware of the emboldened fascist Germany, but she didn't dwell too intensely on the politics of the day because she was rich. She focused instead on breaking gender barriers in the sport that she loved. Of course, all that changed when her priorities shifted from sitting in the driver's seat to running the whole show. It is true that like, you know, it's a privilege to be rich enough to disregard politics. It's like, oh, I don't pay attention to politics. Yeah. Okay. Because you don't have to. Yeah. After a string of losses, Lucy knew she needed to refocus her ambition. Through leading Blue Buzz, a moderately successful team focused solely on sports car races and rallies, Lucy learned she loved leading a team of drivers. Her passion for leadership only grew more fervent after a surprise announcement drastically altered the motorsport landscape. In February of 1936, the Association Internationale des Automobiles Club Reconnaissance, or AIACR, announced a new Grand Prix formula to be implemented from 1937 through 1939. The new formula aimed to limit engine capacity to lower speeds and open up participation to more manufacturers by allowing a more inclusive range of car classifications. The commission proposed a sliding scale of weight to engine size ratios, which meant that naturally aspirated cars would have a maximum capacity of 4.5 liters with a minimum weight of 850 kilos instead of the previous minimum of 750. The maximum capacity of 3 liters would apply to supercharged cars with the same minimum weight of 850 kilos. Charles Ferro, a respected race director, wrote a piece for L'Auto claiming the new formula was a travesty. 
Due to Germany's seemingly limitless funds, this revised formula would only solidify their domination. When Lucy read Faroe's piece and others like it, she recognized her opportunity. In the wake of the new formula announcement and the Rhineland occupation of March 1936, Lucy decided to focus her full attention on forming and running a Grand Prix team. She would be the first woman in history to do so. That's so crazy that Germany's just like starting to annex territories and stuff and they're still just focused on the Grand Prix. Like no one's yeah. like, oh, it's kind of weird that Germany invaded this country. Like, yeah. but let's let's focus on like the race. Honestly, man, with over the past year, I can see how people want to kind of brush aside things and pretend like everything is totally normal. Yeah, if it's know? not affecting them. And also information didn't travel as fast back then. So that's it's like, true. That's if it's true. far, if it's two countries away from you, you're like not focused on it yet. That's a really, that's a great point, Joe, because uh, we, we do tend to, I, or I at least tend to think of things in the modern kind of framework where information is instant and all that but you're right it did you know got to give them some credit there it's good to know that auto journalists have haven't changed this guy that <laughs> thinks like a minor change in engine displacement is a travesty while compared to an actual travesty that's about to happen yeah <laughs> that's true in late 1936 lucy founded oh joe you're gonna have to help me out with this Ecurie bleu Blue. The team name uh, translates very simply to Team Blue, which was a patriotic nod to the color that had represented France since the days of the monarchy. She approached Charles again, uh, Weifenbach, Charles Weifenbach, requesting a four and a half liter race car that she would finance, quote, from top to bottom. Though Weifenbach was initially speechless, he had been told by Delahaye's owners to become a marquee brand. Racing in the Grand Prix would be a surefire way to achieve household-level recognition. He also liked that Lucy wanted to return France to the top of the motorsport world. Everyone except Germany was tired of losing to the Germans. So once again, Charles shook Lucy's hand. Weifenbach went immediately to his lead designer, Jean-Francois, to begin development. That's like the most on-the-nose name I've ever yeah. heard for a French guy. Oh, yeah? What are you doing in here? Uh, a... Uh, what is your name? Uh, uh, Jean Francois. <laughs> <laughs> What's your middle name? Uh, Philip Mignon. <laughs> Francois proposed a naturally aspirated V12 displacement at the formula's maximum of 4.5 liters. He had already done some work on this, but believed that he could adapt his work to fit a Grand Prix model. And by the spring of 1937, four finished cars. Delahaye 145s weighed in at 850 kilograms, the formula minimum, and they were ready for testing. Nice. With the cars sailing through development, they just needed one more thing, and that was a worthy driver. I will say is... the fenders look like something that Dr. Seuss would draw. It does. It just looks like a car like from Go Dog Go. Like they, they yeah, <laughs> that's like, the car. It looks like a car that when it goes around a corner, the front goes around first. <laughs> And like a wolf in a zoot suit is yeah. driving it. <laughs> this the the coupe or like the road coupe uh, looks like the the car that Peter Griffin gets and <laughs> goes into the tunnel. <laughs> As team owner, Lucy was looking for something special in her team captain, and that's where a driver named Rene Dreyfus entered the picture. Rene was one of those early race car drivers that a veteran journalist described as possessing the look. A stare of searing intensity and undying affection that lets you know without a doubt Rene was put on earth to drive cars fast. <laughs> However, due to a near-death accident and the loss of several friends from the circuit, Rene nearly missed his opportunity to become a legendary driver. Thanks to Lucy Schell's tenacity and their shared disdain for fascist Germany, Rene joined Ecurie Bleu for the 1938 season as team captain. Hell yeah. But first, who was Rene Dreyfus and why did Lucy Schell pick him to lead Ecurie Bleu? Rene was born May 6, 1905 in Nice, France to a middle class Jewish father and Catholic mother. Uh, <laughs> it's like his family walks into a bar is a joke. Uh, <laughs> Though Rene never identified as Jewish, his father's identity, as well as the surname Dreyfus, would come to play a huge role in his career. 
Seemingly from infancy, Rene knew he wanted to become a professional race car driver, a lofty dream given his background. His first major race took place on February 25, 1926, when Rene was only 20 years old, so young that he needed his mother's written permission to enter. What? Oh, yeah. he needed his mom's permission at 20. Different time, man. I guess. You, back then, you were a baby till you were 30. That's true. But somehow you could marry at 13. Yeah, you got married at 13, but you still mama's baby. <laughs> Imagine having to need a permission slip at 20 years old, dude. <laughs> that would suck. Rene oh. garnered attention with an excellent showing at the 1930 Monaco Grand Prix. The night before he took the wheel, Rene realized that if he added an additional tank to his Bugatti, then he could skip a pit stop and save a few minutes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> his manager was hesitant due to safety concerns, but in the end, acquiesced. Rene's gamble paid off. Despite the skilled driving of competitor Louis Chiron, Rene won his first major Grand Prix in a Bugatti, all because he added the additional tank. And Joe, you brought up Chiron earlier. That's yeah. The guys, that's who it is. Louis Chiron. And, and Louis also, Chiron. Uh, Devo was a driver, a Bugatti driver at this time. And they also made a Bugatti Devo recently, which we saw oh my up God. close. That thing was insane. Yeah. Definitely... Definitely the most expensive car I've probably ever seen. Yeah, uh, I think it's got far. like 1,500 horsepower. It's smaller than I thought. Yeah. Um, and it's just super sick. Wouldn't want to parallel park that thing. <laughs> <laughs> no thanks. <laughs> no, uh, no, uh, no thank you. Uh, no thank you. <laughs> From 1931 until 1937, Rene drove for Maserati, Bugatti, Scuderia, Ferrari, and Alfa Romeo with varying degrees of success. Hmm. During the 1932 Grand Prix du Cominges, uh, he <laughs> suffered a nearly fatal crash due to a faulty accelerator and begged to be released from Maserati's team, and they obliged. Although death was always intertwined with motorsport, this experience shook Rene to his core. He got the fear. Yeah, man. Like Tom Cruise got, got or the Ricky yips. Bobby. And as a result, he became a more hesitant driver. After the 1934 season, Bugatti's team manager, Mayo Constantini, had key, some key advice for Rene. Words that would ring in his head for years to come. Rene, you could be one of the greatest drivers in the world where it's not for one thing. You're not aggressive enough. You're too steady, too dependable. <laughs> his early success had come to him too easily and the manager urged Rene to find something to struggle and fight for until that moment he claimed greatness would elude him dude greatness it will elude you <laughs> although it stung to hear Rene knew he was right I gotta take this advice as well man like I'm like pretty good at eye racing I've got a 2000 eye rating on road which is decent you know, for someone who hasn't been doing that long, I routinely get top 10, top five finishes, but I do not win very often. It's because I'm too safe, you know? No, yeah. you are too dependable. That's right. You're driving. It is too safe. It is like watching a boring disaster. <laughs> Renee's career came to another standstill after the 1935 season with Ferrari. While the team wanted him to continue racing for them, Mussolini had demanded that the 1936 team had to be all Italian. All right? Nobody who's not freaking Italian, okay? I don't want to see one freaking guy on this goddamn team who's not Italian, all right? Mussolini is from Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> That's my Mussolini impression. He did not want a Frenchman dressed in red, especially not one named Dreyfus. It soon became clear that Rene would have few options, if any, as a Jewish driver. Enter once more Lucy Shell. Lucy knew that to run a successful Grand Prix team, she would need an established, dependable driver that had the stomach for taking orders from a woman. Basically, she was looking for someone desperate enough to show her respect, and one name came to mind, Rene Dreyfus. Though they rarely shared more than a short conversation here or there, she had seen him race dozens of times. Lucy knew Rene to be a calm, skilled driver, and even though he presently lacked the fire to win, she felt she could inspire him to greatness. Hmm. When Lucy met with Rene in the autumn of 1936, he was struck by her energy and enthusiasm. She gave him the hard sell. 
Delahaye had proven they could build fast, reliable cars, and with her money, Renee would not be left wanting. He would be provided a salary, have his pick of other drivers, and could help develop and test drive the new car. Most importantly, he would have his chance to beat the Germans and return France to the winner's circle. Renee agreed, and later went on record saying, Lucy was a lady who talked a very good story. I mean, I mean how could you say no, though? Uh, Lucy believed Renee would garner more attention for Team Blue if he made his debut in a competition he had never run before, the Monte Carlo Rally. Rene agreed, but was hesitant. He defined himself as a race car driver who liked to go vroom vroom fast, so driving in the rally with Lori Shell would certainly be a change of pace. It wasn't on like a road course or anything. It was on like actual roads, not on a racetrack. Over the 2,300 miles to Monte Carlo, Rene gained more respect for Lucy's career and got to know how the Delahaye drove. He and Lori finished fifth overall, while another Delahaye driver, Rene Lebourg, one first place. So Delahaye's got some heat going. Meanwhile, France's response to Germany's winning streak was to establish a 10 franc fee on each French driver's license, which would then fund French automakers in developing a Grand Prix car that fit the new formula. Hmm. There were two competitions to win funding. Bugatti won the first due to a rather unfair and possibly rigged engine limit. But the second performance challenge promised a prize of a million francs to the French driver and team whose car was able to cover 200 kilometers or 124.3 miles at a speed exceeding 146 and a half kilometers or 91 miles per hour by the widest margin before September 1st of 1937. This competition would be where Team Blue and Rene Dreyfus would make their mark. To compete for the million francs, Jean-Francois developed the Delahaye 145. Described as an ugly winged beetle or an electric light bulb tilted on its side, the car did not resemble its trim, elegant predecessor. Instead, it had a blunt, broad snout, and its body housing the V12 engine maintained the same thick girth all the way from the front <laughs> to the back of the cockpit, with its sides drawing in slightly towards the flattened tail. The car also had an extraordinarily low build, which made it look even longer and wider than it really was. To increase its speed, the mechanics had hollowed out many of the parts, including the chassis, that did not affect the structural rigidity. They had even punched holes in the gas, brake, and clutch pedals. Uh, like we said, it looks like something that Dr. Seuss uh, would draw, <laughs> but it was fast. It's tight looking. And that's yeah. what matters most. I really like the, the coupe version that you sent, Joe. The, I believe that's a road going version of the car. Yeah. Uh, that coupe is really sick. And I also sent the picture of the uh, 135, which is below it, in the which looks <laughs> insane, possibly more insane. Across the country, French automakers worked tirelessly in an attempt to prepare a car worthy of the prize, but in the end, only Bugatti and Delahaye were the true competitors. The spotlight on Le Drama du Million was intense, but there was hope within the country that France could once again produce a worthy car for the 1938 Grand Prix season and finally defeat the Germans. Both Bugatti and Delahaye brought their cars to the track at Montlhéry in August of 1937, just a few short weeks before the deadline. You know, we're going to get some comments that are like, I'm, I'm from right outside of Montlhéry and Nolan totally butchered it. <laughs> and to that I say adieu. <laughs> uh yeah. <laughs> the national attention on Le Million terrified Rene, who continuously put off the race. He claimed he needed more time to practice, that he was losing too much time in his early laps. On the evening of August twenty sixth, his wife, Shushu, answered a call from Charles, later telling her husband it was a social call. The next morning, Shushu woke Rene to tell him he would be trying the million that morning. Rene tried to protest, but the media had been informed and the timekeepers were already on their way. No backing out now. You don't want to reschedule with the timekeepers. They are strict. Yeah, they've got a real tight schedule. They're always late. <laughs> uh, anyway, Rene was furious with his team for lying to him and barely made eye contact before he began. He triple-checked his shoelaces, a good luck ritual, and then climbed into the Delahaye. He would need to drive 16 laps, 200 kilometers, in one hour, 21 minutes, and 54 seconds. Whoa. 
uh, or less to beat the Bugatti. So that's like a base, like that's like an average speed of ninety-one miles per hour. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. For two hundred, whoa, that's fun. And on a personal level, Rene wanted to prove that, regardless of politics, that he was one of the best drivers in the world. He had finally reawakened the competitive spirit that led him to claim his first Grand Prix victory. At one hour, twenty-one minutes, forty-nine and a half seconds, Rene qualified for the million exactly four point nine seconds under the limit. After he finished the hardest drive of his life, Rene stated simply, To win the prize, it is necessary to take great risks. He had I found am not just dependable. <laughs> I have the fire. Greatness would not elude me. <laughs> and it did not elude me today. He had found his baba fire. Booey, baba booey, baba booey, <laughs> baba booey. Rene had driven Team Blue and Delahaye into the national spotlight. Unfortunately and predictably, Lucy Shell's name was barely mentioned in a single article about the prize. Come on. That is f- <laughs> up. Yeah. This story leads us to the Powell Grand Prix, the inaugural race of the 1938 season. At over 100 laps, a single mistake could ruin a driver's chances at victory or worse. Ecurie Bleu and Rene Dreyfus, fresh off their win of Le Million, were nervous yet confident about debuting their new formula. Rene felt that he never wanted to win more, and he had finally found his reason to race to defeat the Germans in a symbolic victory against their ridiculous claims of superiority. Lucy Shell was elsewhere to compete in a concourse de élégance in Cannes, but checked in regularly. Although it's impossible to know why she chose not to be present for the first major race of her Grand Prix team, it's easy to imagine that being there in the flesh would be nerve-wracking. Uh, I think like Kate Blanchett would. Oh, she would nail this. Yeah, it's like sort of predictable casting, but you know there is a reason. Yeah, and maybe like uh, Pedro Pascal as Rene. Yeah, he's got a little Ooh. bit of pain behind his eyes. Uh huh. Yeah, that's great. I mean, hey, we're that's big Blanchett boys here on Past Gas. If you want to listen to our other podcast, uh, Big Blanchett Boys, <laughs> where we talk about Kate Blanchett and her work both on and off screen. Uh, Check that out anywhere podcasts are available. Big thanks to Chime for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Hey, here's a thought. How about your bank works for you and not against you? Chime is an award-winning app and debit card with no hidden fees or no monthly minimums. That means you're not gonna get fined for having less than a thousand bucks in your account, which has happened to me a bunch of times. Oh, you're broke? Well, how about I make it worse for you? That's not what Chime does. And after all, you earned your money. Why shouldn't you be able to keep it? There's a bunch of different reasons why Chime is so cool. One of them is because it's got fee-free overdraft on up to $100 in debit purchases with SpotMe. It's like overdraft protection, but better. Which I can tell you from personal experience is super helpful. Get your paycheck, benefits, stimulus check, and tax return up to two days earlier with direct deposit. There's no hidden fees or monthly minimums, plus 38,000 fee-free ATMs with Money Pass and Visa Plus Alliance. Security is also a priority for Chime. You can turn on alerts to let you know when your card is being used and instantly block your card if it gets stolen or something seems a little bit fishy. But it's not just debit. You can also sign up for a Chime spending account and enroll in an optional savings account that will grow your savings automatically with half a percent annual percentage yield, 10 times the national average. Again, this is an optional thing. You don't have to sign up for that. Join the millions on Chime. Sign up takes two minutes and it doesn't affect your credit score. Apply now at chime.com slash GAS. That's chime.com slash gas. And now for the legal stuff. Chime is a financial technology company. Banking services provided by the Bank Corp or Stride Bank NA. Members FDIC. Eligibility requirements and overdraft limits apply. Overdraft only applies to debit card purchases. Limits start at $20 and may be increased by up to $100 by Chime. Early direct deposit depends on the payer. Out of network cash withdrawal fees apply. Third party and cash deposit fees may apply. Go to chime.com slash gas for details. Thank you, Chime. Big old thanks to Curology Men's Skin Care for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. If you've been opting out of skin care, I get it. I didn't know I could wash my face until I was 27. True story. The truth is, most of us actually care about our skin. We just don't know where to start. If you're looking for something simple that works without being complicated, then you have to get Curology. 
Curology makes skincare effortless. They create a custom skincare formula for your skin goals. Plus, they've got a cleanser and moisturizer that are easy on your skin and super easy to use. That's a big thing. It's got to be easy to use, and Curology nails that. All you have to do is input your skin type, and Curology's dermatology provider will help you find out the perfect routine for your skin, which is super convenient, like one personalized just for you. And it doesn't matter what type of skin you have or what you're struggling with. If you have acne, dark spots, or you just want something simple and straightforward to wash your face, they got everything. There's no more guesswork. Personally, I love Curology. It's super easy to use. I was able to put my information in and get exactly what I need in seconds. Like, it was very easy to use. I got my products shipped to me, and everything was really easy to do and worked really well. So that's why I love Curology. Everything ships right to your door and your first 30 days are free. All you gotta do is just cover five bucks for shipping and handling, which is a bargain. No more last minute trips to the store. They also have some other amazing products you can add to your subscription, like an acne body wash or emergency spot patches. So you can do it up or keep it simple. Literally, all you gotta do is log on to curology.com slash gas, input your type of skin. If you don't know what type of skin you got, they got questions to help you figure that out. And in minutes, you're gonna have like a plan to make your skin healthier, clearer, whatever you want. If you're ready for healthier skin and a routine that makes sense, do what I did, give Curology a go. Go to curology.com slash gas. For a free 30-day trial, just pay for shipping and handling, that's all. That's C-U-R-O-L-O-G-Y dot com slash gas to unlock your free 30-day trial. See curology.com for all the details. Thank you for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas Curology. The race itself would be a tough one. As a historian noted, the French had not defeated the very last thing in Mercedes racing cars since the Sarth Cup at Le Mans in 1913. And before that one, had to go back to the early Grand Prix and Gordon Bennett days. Oh, the Gordon Bennett days, man. <laughs> the old Gordon Bennett days of summer. <laughs> one newspaper stated, The outcome of this race is now such a complete certainty that no bookmaker would take any money on the Germans, even at heavy odds on prices. The Germans don't make the kind of mistakes peculiar to the average mortal, and with Caracciola and Lang driving, what is there to add? <laughs> in, in short, no one thought Ecuri Bleu could win, regardless of their success with the Lamilla or the Uber Quick. Interesting looking Del Hay 145. April 10th, 1938 was certain to be a historic day, not just in motorsport. Hitler's army had invaded nearby Austria and would be sending around a vote to the plebiscite in Germany to determine approval for the Greater Reich's first conquest. Okay. Mercedes director Wilhelm Kissel had done the footwork of linking this event with the PAL Grand Prix, claiming in a speech that Hitler led the German automobile industry away from the edge of the abyss and paved the way for its unprecedented rise. For this, we must thank him with a worker, engineer, salesman, technician, or director. On April 10th, 1938, with all our hearts to all yes! So, <laughs> they actually, they sent out a vote to, the Germans voted on whether or not to invade Austria? Oh, okay, so they already invaded Austria, and then they sent yeah. out a vote to be like, hey, should we make this part of Germany? Okay. Yeah, at that point, it kind of feels like, it's like, should we make? What do you say, guys? Yeah. Should we make this part of Germany? I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not an expert on this time period, but it sounds like the regime probably would have made it happen regardless of what the outcome of the vote was. Yeah, yeah. Okay. At the, I think it's more of like a call and response, getting people pumped. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's, and then they yeah, link it to the know. race, and it's like yeah. there's a very nationalistic atmosphere. It's a confusing thing. The night before the race, Rene realized that he had never beaten Mercedes driver Rudy Caracciola. He also knew that the Mercedes W154 was faster off the line, produced almost double the horsepower, and benefited from far more advanced brakes and suspension than his Delahaye 145. Regardless, he had noticed issues with the cars during the time trials. The W154 would need to refuel halfway through the race. Rene would not. Make up a lot of time. The cars suffered from wheel spin on certain corners because their engines were too powerful for the PAL course. And finally, 
The course was designed in such a way that 100 miles per hour is the maximum speed one could reasonably keep. Thus, despite the apparent superiority of their Mercedes, the Delahaye driver had reason to suspect he might be able to eke out a win after all. Nice. all right. Yeah, just all some right. smooth good. driving and some smart fuel management, and you're good. Rene is dependable. <laughs> <laughs> that same evening, Lucy had called Lori with some uh, odd information. Do tell. While by the seashore in Nice, she stopped in to see a fortune teller. The woman asked Lucy if she owned a stable of mechanical horses or racing things. Hmm. Lucy was floored. The fortune teller then told Lucy that one of them would win the next day. Whoa. When Lori took the call, he simply laughed and was determined not to tell Renee lest he get in his driver's That's smart. Head. Yeah, Renee, you need to protect him. You know what I mean? He's Renee, a little bit fragile he's brilliant but she, he's a sensitive artist you know a little like me in that way that's i love how the fortune teller doesn't know that cars exist <laughs> <laughs> so i'm seeing mechanical horses horses with or, wheels on their hooves it is like a horse but the wheel the legs are round <laughs> And the horse's mouth is <laughs> This is 1938. Oh. <laughs> like, cars have been around for more than 30 years. He makes stinky farts. It's going to be a problem, but not for you. Very far. <laughs> Very far in the future, the stinky farts will make their yeah, oceans rise. What are you talking about? <laughs> the stinky farts of the mechanical horses will make the oceans rise. <laughs> What? <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna tell my driver that he's gonna win tomorrow. But by the morning of the race, half of the competitors had dropped out due to issues meeting the new formula regulations or mechanical failures during practice runs. To make it an even tighter race, it soon became clear that Mercedes's second driver, Herman Lang, would be unable to compete. His oil pump was faulty, and the spark plug continued to get screwed up during practice trials. The sp- <laughs> Isn't that crazy how, like, oh, I'm having a problem with my oil pump. Guess I can't race for a Mercedes yeah. at the Grand Prix. Yeah. Despite the Mercedes team's massive mobile workshops, complete with lathe, welding plant, and a rig to test shock absorbers, the mechanics could not adequately fix his car in time. Hmm. As a result, only Caracciola would be racing on behalf of the Germans. It would be Rene against Caracciola. Whether David could triumph over Goliath remained to be seen. Renee's strategy was to hang close to Caracciola until the W154 had to pit for fuel and then pull away. Renee was able to pressure Caracciola so aggressively early in the race, even swapping the lead position, that when Caracciola pitted, the German asked to be replaced by Lang, who didn't expect to be racing that day. Oh. Lang frantically changed into his racing overalls. Caracciola blamed his poor performance on his damaged leg from a previous racing accident. And maybe... Just maybe. <laughs> he didn't want the vengeful Fuhrer to see him lose. Yeah. And Lang stopped for an unnecessary pit stop a little later, perhaps in an attempt to blame the vehicle for their feet. See also vengeful Fuhrer. <laughs> <laughs> in the end, Rene finished ahead of Lang by two full minutes. Whoa. The fortune teller was right. Lucy's mechanical horse beat Hitler's. The stinky farts <laughs> did become a problem, <laughs> causing the oceans to rise. And we're all bound for a cruise ship and the only people <laughs> left on earth are going to be cute little robots <laughs> harvesting trash. Well, get <laughs> Hitler. That's all I'll say. <laughs> yeah, man. The fact that a Jewish driver on a Grand Prix team owned by a woman was able to defeat the German machine is a stuff of legend. That this isn't a major Oscar-worthy movie is frankly shocking. And like we said, Kate we Bl- cast it yeah, just Kate now. We cast the whole thing. Kate Kate Blanchett. Willem Dafoe uh, as Hitler. Willem Dafoe as <laughs> Hitler. No, dude, I want to see him. He can be uh, uh, Rudy Caracciola. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Dude, get he's, with he's like a, a little, little old. He's a little old. He yeah. is a little old, but you know what? I don't care. Give him give him like a nice little mustache, tw- twirled no, you gotta mustache. Get the, you got to get uh, either Christoph Waltz yep. or, oh. the, or the German guy from the Avengers movies. And also uh, in. Uh, yeah. Dude, yes, yes, yes. Uh, 
uh, Christoph Waltz as Caracciola. Oh my Dude, god, that'd be amazing. Oscar, 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 Oscar. This movie prints Oscars. Dude, Jason Alexander got- as the uh, head of Delahy. Like, <laughs> yeah. Kind of nervous. Like- I think. I think we have ourselves a deal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and <laughs> anyway. Uh, Rene's symbolic defeat over anti-Semitism and the rabid hatred he faced at the hands of fascists inspired a generation of drivers. Lucy's triumph over misogyny in a male-dominated sphere is in itself inspiring to the speed queens who followed in her footsteps. Yeah. Though Delahaye is now defunct, the company succeeded for another 20 years thanks to the Pau Grand Prix's marquee-raising win. In the end, our underdogs won. Today's story ends on an especially satisfying note. Rumor has it that during the German invasion of France, Hitler ordered that the car that defeated Germany be destroyed. Fortunately, Charles Weifenbach had the Delahays disassembled and hidden, so poor little Fuhrer was once again defeated by his ingenuity. Nice. Despite Hitler's best efforts, the tale of Rene Dreyfus, his ugly Delahay, and their champion Lucy Schell would have remained a fabled part of motorsport history and is now immortalized forever on past gas. Yeah. So, f- <laughs> Hitler. <laughs> Up your nose with the rubber hose, hit boy. And watch out this summer for uh, Speed Queen starring Kate Blanchett, <laughs> uh, Pedro Kate Pascal, Blanchett. Lucy Shell, and Paul Giamatti <laughs> as Hitler. <laughs> Uh, that's our story. <laughs> Why does Hitler look like an angry squirrel? <laughs> the story is over, but we're just getting started, baby. It's time for our secret section of the show that you may have been missing out on. It's the secret of the week. Welcome to Secret of the Week. Um, Joe, how about you lead us off with Whoa. your secret of the week? Wait, okay. no, I think I think it's one secret, not we go around and all. Oh, okay, it's secret. one secret. It's one secret of well, the week. Well, yeah. all right. Does anyone have a secret of the week they'd like to divulge? Who has a secret? Mm. All right, I got one. Okay. <clears throat> Back in uh, seventh grade, I was not a very good, or eighth grade rather, I was having a real hard time in math, and um, I. I you know, we'd, we'd get those progress reports mailed home, right? Yeah, that yeah. tell your parents what of grade course. you're getting. Oh, no. And so I got home before my parents did, and I intercepted our progress report. Oof. Whoa. I knew, I knew where this was yeah. going. And I threw it in the trash. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, <laughs> Airtight. Airtight. Yeah, airtight. <laughs> threw it in that recycling bin, and I'm very sorry to mom and dad. I think, luckily, I've... I've, I've I've made it. I'm good. I've made, I have a good job now, so it's okay. Yeah. But mm-hmm. yeah, man, you've been carrying that around for years. That's How does it feel to week. get that off your chest? Uh, pretty good. Pretty good. Um, I, you know, in retrospect, it probably wouldn't have had a huge effect on my life at that point. I was just really afraid of letting them know that I was getting a D in math. I was just really bad at math. Yeah. You're here. You're here now. Does it matter? I am. You don't even need to do math. We have robots and computers. Yeah. Oh my God. Isn't that so great? Dude. Yeah. I was thinking about that last night, how I'm so glad I don't have to do homework anymore. Well, we've really had a lot of fun recording this one, and I hope that you guys had a lot of fun listening to it. We do this every week. Uh, to make it easier to listen to, go ahead and subscribe to the Past Gas Podcast. Um, and it'll alert you about new episodes as well as new projects that we'll be working on and rolling out for you guys. Follow Joe on social media at Joe G Weber. Follow Nolan at Nolan J Sykes. Thank Follow you. me at James Pumphrey. If you don't already know, we have a YouTube channel, Donut Media. We make videos. We make t-shirts. <laughs> you can get them at DonutMedia.com. Keep it juiced. <laughs> I love you. Bye. Be kind. See ya. <laughs>